بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين نحييكم يوم الاثنين 5 أبريل 2021 في هذه الندوة أو المؤتمر القصير نتحدث فيه عن تغييم البحث العلمي في العالم العربي وخصوصا نأخذ مثال من جائحة كورونا اللي هو نتمنى الله أنه يعني كل العالم يمر منها بسلام وفي البداية يعني نتمنى رب سبحانه وتعالى أن يتقبل كل من فقدناهم ليس في العالم العربي فقط في كل العالم وهذه جائحة يعني فالعالم فقد بالملايين من جائحة الكورونا تركيزنا حيكون على تغييم سريع لأداء البحث العلمي في العالم العربي ونأخذ ظاهرة أو جائحة كورونا كمثال I will uh, switch into English because this uh, webinar is going to be in English language because we have people from all over the world uh, participating. Uh, just for you uh, boys, before we start, we have distinguished five speakers. We are very pleased to have them from Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Tunisia, and uh, Professor Abdul Khaliq. He is Algerian uh, senior professor in Lille University, but he is the chairman also of the Maghrib Tech, which is an organization involving all the people in North Africa, in the Maghrib, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, and, and so on. And uh, well, each one of them will be given an opportunity to make his uh, few points. The idea of this conference really is to shed light very briefly in preparation of a big conference we are planning to organize in the future about uh, rigorous evaluation of the scientific research in the Middle East and North Africa, not just in Arab countries, but the entire Middle East and North Africa. We are organizing this part of our online activities in the Middle East and Knowledge Economy Institute, which is part of the affiliations of the World Association for Sustainable Development. This uh, uh, webinar or seminar is broadcasted live in all our social media. So you just need to refer anyone to the social media, either all our Facebook, all our social media is now connected. And uh, we will be giving people opportunity to ask questions or to reflect on the discussion. But due to the time, we really wanted to close this uh, seminar under two hours because of the commitment of our speakers with other engagement. But please uh, be assured, if you ask your question in the social media, we will bring it to the speakers here in the in the Zoom, and they will answer it. Now, the, the, the topic for today is being brought uh, for the attention of the, to all academics and governments from the public. The general public have raised this question. This question has been raised uh, for a long time, but during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or global uh, pandemic, there have been lots of questions. And I remember one of the people who, uh, one of the comments I received from uh, our colleagues in was, where are the Arab scientists? This question has been asked, where are the Arab scientists? Because people have been following the COVID-19 or the coronavirus pandemic, they can clearly see there is lots of contribution uh, in terms of combating uh, the virus plus all of the public health, if you like, uh, episodes, uh, scenarios, uh, methodologies, approaches, but more importantly, the vaccine itself, which is becoming one of the key issues getting us out of this uh, pandemic. So the vaccine, as you all know, none of the vaccine actually came from any of the Arabic countries. Uh, most scientists who are leading in the front line worldwide are mostly from other countries such as the UK, Germany, Belgium, the US, Sweden, I think in uh, uh, Russia, there are scientists, China and so on, even the vaccine, which is now widely used. Let's take example of United Arab Emirates, Chinese vaccine, uh, American vaccine, Chinese. Yes, of course, this is the era of globalization and we have argued that we all collaborating. But the question of where is our clear contribution to solve global problems. Yes, we are referring to the COVID-19 or the coronavirus as an example, but we, we are very pleased to have one of the leading knowledge economy or knowledge economy, uh, if you like, expert in the country of Kuwait, which is an example of Arabic countries. He's leading a national government projects also will be contributing because the future is on digital knowledge and so on. Now, I would like to also highlight another thing. Back 
1991, very long time ago. There's a very famous quote by the current uh, president of Bureau. At that time, he was the senior uh, uh, Sagasti, His Excellency, the president. He's also an academic himself, but he used to be a senior uh, economic advisor to the World Bank. He has a very famous talk in 1991. They call it UNESCO talk. In that talk, he said, globalizations bringing us closer together, which is exactly what happened during the COVID-19. We are very close now because we are fighting one common threat, one common enemy, and we have to find a one common solution out of this. We can't do it alone. So that one, what he said in 1991. And then he said what he's worried about in the future, he said, which is now, we will have two, uh, two groups of, uh, uh, the world it will be divided what he called it, a knowledge divide. A group of countries or scientists or people who they produce knowledge and therefore they have the capacity to change it, to modify it, to fit their needs. Like the, the vaccine now, we have the scientists in the UK at Oxford, they are producing the knowledge or the vaccine, so they are able to change it, to modify it, they are testing it now. And now we know that testing is already started on kids now in America. And he said there will be a group of us, referring to many countries, who will be passively receiving knowledge from the other part of the world. And therefore, they do not have the capacity to change it or modify it. And that exactly, he's now the president of Bureau. But when he said this, he was senior advisor to the World Bank. And also, Professor Elaine, which I invited him to comment at the end, he is one of the senior consultants for World Bank as well from Cameroon. We can give him that opportunity. So. Uh, Arab countries or Arab scientists as an example of developing countries of other countries, I don't want to say they represent the part which Sagasti at that time, 1991, referred to them as passively receiving. We will hear now, are, are the Arab scientists are passively receiving knowledge and science from outside uh, their territories and they have no ability to change it and modify. It. We will see. So this is the kind of discussion we want to do it. As I said, this is just a brief short uh, snapshot from leading expert in the region. We will continue this, but we are planning for a big conference. We don't know when, but we are really hoping we can do it face to face. We are very hopeful. Let's send a very positive message. We have a senior scientist here. He might give us that uh, positive message better than me because he is the leading from Professor Mahid is the leading scientist. Me, But I think we are hopeful. I'm going to start uh, uh, the, the, the conference by uh, I'm very proud to call her a leading woman, uh, Arabic woman worldwide. She's, she's a true leader. She's a director uh, of scientific research at the Kingdom of Bahrain in higher education. She's highly qualified. She got a PhD from Brunel. She's ex ex very specialized in very uh, important topics. Uh, and she is being known uh, across the Middle East or across the world in her work in terms of policy, in terms of uh, how government deal with scientific research. So uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Farzana Al-Maragi. She is the scientific di research director for the Kingdom of Bahrain. Uh, Dr. Farzana, I, if you can unmute yourself and I already giving you the share and the floor is yours. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Alam, uh, uh, for this introduction and for inviting us to this prestigious event. Actually, uh, it's our pleasure to, to join you and uh, with uh, uh, and to hear and, and listen from my, my colleagues. Um, I'm sure I will learn a lot uh, today. Um, if you allow me, uh, I share my presentation. Uh, I have a few slides just to share with you. Uh, okay, then. So. Yes, we can see it. Just make it as big as you can display. Yes. Okay, sure, sure, sure. So, yes, perfect. Is it clear with you now? Perfect, go okay. ahead. Okay, okay. So I'll take a few few minutes. Uh, I know we are allowed for 10 to 15 minutes. So I'll take a few minutes to just, just to remind us, I'm sure that uh, most of you are familiar with, with the, the indicators of, of Arab uh, uh, research uh, compared to the, to the world, but I think we need to start with a few figures to, to remind us how uh, the Arab uh, research is, is doing compared to um, 
uh, to the world. So uh, here are the, the, the main areas. Uh, I'll talk about the Arab research indicators and then a uh, few slides on, on, on what have been done uh, regarding COVID-19 research. And then I'll take Bahrain as an example. Uh, I know that most Arab countries have similar let's say challenges or obstacles or um, you know uh, in research environment uh, more or less plus or minus uh, it, it, it differs a bit but in general um, we have the same uh, the same uh, you know uh, research environment generally so i'll take bahrain as an example uh, um, uh, so let's start with with uh, arab research indicators compared to the world so i think we all know that, that, that most of, of the shares of the R&D expenditure comes from two areas in the world. Almost 90% comes from either West or East, so uh, far, far West or Far East. So it's uh, North America and Western Europe and East Asia and the Pacific. This is the 90% almost of the expenditure on, on research, while Arab countries contribute to only 2% of the overall world uh, expenditure on, on research. Uh, if we want to uh, look into the um, percentages of the GDP, um, again, the Arabs are 0.61% of the GDP spending on research while it is two point something in, in, in other parts of the world. So uh, uh, the, these show how, how research uh, the, uh, um, you know, as um, uh, I mean, the, the expenditure on research, how how it's compared to to other countries. So um, uh, again, uh, here are some uh, uh, countries how much they spend on, on research, but we cannot see the, the Arab countries here because it's 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 very much less. Uh, regarding the the publication, scientific and technical. Uh, the, um, uh, journals or articles, the, the Arab is contributing only to 2% of the overall world, uh, the, um, uh, you know, papers. Uh, there are 2.5 million, so that's 98% from the world and 2% only from, from the, the Arab countries. If we want to see the growth, then starting 2000 and, until 2019, uh, let's say, or 18, uh, we can see that the world uh, publication is growing in millions, while the, the Arab countries is, is very slowly growing, very, very slowly growing. Um, uh, SIR uh, classification for academic research related institutions, uh, we can see the first uh, uh, Arab university appeared in this uh, classification is King Saud University, and it ranked 165 over the world. And, 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 and here is a list of, of, of the uh, 10 uh, highly ranked uh, Arab universities, uh, which started from 165 uh, uh, compared to the world ranking. Uh, this graph shows uh, how institutions are distributed by the research output in 2021 uh, as per the SIR uh, ranking. Uh, this is for all regions and countries. Uh, if, if you can see the green dots are for the universities and the, the red ones are for the companies. We start with the USA, China, France, and so on. So uh, here are the percentiles you can see. It's, it's, uh, we can see a lot of, of red companies, uh, red dots are, are there, and uh, there's a huge contribution. So this is for the world. If we move to the Arab countries, we can see it's very, very few uh, and mostly within the universities. So the research has happened mostly, mostly within the universities. Egypt is number one and then Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Iraq, Morocco and so on. So uh, and if we want to see the percentiles here, uh, again, uh, companies do not appear really very clearly. Uh, so Arab nation contribution to the world's COVID research. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in the introduction, uh, Professor Alam talked about Saudi Arabia uh, ranked as first, uh, uh, first in the Arab world. Uh, so um, uh, uh, we can see the contribution of Saudi Arabia has been ranked 14th internationally for, for its COVID-19 university research rising from its previous 17th ranking according to the database of the Web of Science. And 84% uh, of those researchers are accounted for the Saudi universities. Uh, 
uh, they had 19, uh, sorry, 915 scientific publications related to the, uh, uh, to the pandemic. So this is about Saudi Arabia. Uh, if we, uh, um, there is another piece of research uh, comparing the, the Arab region contribution to global COVID-19 uh, research. So for the period between December 2019 and March 2021, the search for publication was conducted in Scopus uh, uh, related to COVID-19. There is 143975 publication and 6131 documents are from the Arab countries. So that's 4.26 of the global research out, output regarding COVID-19 were done by the Arab countries. So uh, here are the different classifications, whether it's a journal, review article, or letters or others. Uh, Saudi Arabia comes the first and then followed by Egypt and then United Arab Emirates. Um, after standardization of, of population size, we see um, Saudi Arabia first and then UAE, Lebanon uh, as uh, ranked in terms of the COVID-19 related research. The collaboration were mostly with researchers from the United States and United Kingdom. Uh, the main research, uh, research lines were public health and uh, epidemiology, uh, immunology, and for some, uh, for pharmaceutical research, signs, symptoms, and so on. So this is regarding the uh, COVID-19 related research in the Arab countries. Uh, also, uh, Arab women scientists advancing scientific research uh, admits to the pandemic. This, uh, this was uh, hosted by the UNESCO event for L'Oreal Prize. So uh, Arab women scientists um, uh, participated in, in the COVID-related uh, research. If we move to, to Bahrain and some uh, uh, you know, related indicators to, to the GCC, uh, during the 2014-2019 the scholarly out, output, uh, we had in Bahrain 3,538 scholarly output in Scopus, uh, 2861 authors, and the citation count was almost 40,000 40, and 11.1 .1 citation per publication. And the world, uh, sorry, the, the, the field weighted citation impact was 2.35. Um, here, there are some positive uh, indicators that, that the, uh, there was an increase in the number of publications in Scopus by 67%, uh, increase in number of authors, the, 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 the average uh, uh, weight um, was more than the world average. Uh, if we look uh, into the trend, we can see there is a growth. However, uh, comparing this to some GCC countries, which are a li little bit related in, in size, we, we didn't compare with Saudi Arabia because the size is, is too different, but uh, comparing with Oman and Kuwait, uh, still in, in Oman and Kuwait, there are uh, much more publications and, and all are growing. Um, uh, uh, inside Bahrain, if we want to uh, uh, compare the institutions, University of Bahrain has the highest, uh, again, the size uh, matters. Um, then comes Arabian Gulf University. Uh, however, we can see that, that the citation for Arabian Gulf University is, is very much higher than, than almost all, all other countries. That's 50.3 50, 50 uh, per, uh, per publication. Um, uh, per subject, uh, and interestingly, uh, medicine is, 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 is the strongest research in Bahrain. So uh, uh, even in, in terms of the quality and citation and in terms of the quantity. So 22.6% uh, 22 of the overall uh, uh, publication in Bahrain is in medicine. And then uh, it comes engineering and then computer science. So science in general, uh, science and engineering uh, are the most shares in Bahrain. So uh, again, if, if, if we check the uh, field weighted citation impact, again, medicine has the highest field weighted citation impact, that, that's more than four, and again, uh, highest number of publication and then engineering, computer science, and so on. Uh, if we want to compare Bahrain to the uh, uh, Arab countries, so Bahrain's uh, publication in top 10 most cited is 9.2% only while it's 12 in the Arab countries, and then uh, the citation is 14.2, while it's 20.4 in the Arab countries. The collaboration is with Saudi Arabia, United States, United Kingdom, India, Egypt, Malaysia, and United Arab Emirates. 
Uh, here are some, some interesting uh, figures about the uh, indicators of re for research in, 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 the, in Bahrain. And, uh, and as I mentioned, this is uh, somehow similar in, in, in a few other countries. So for example, research accounts for science or STEM students or STEM research mostly. If we look into the, the, the figures, we have very little proportion of students in STEM education, science, mathematics, and engineering. So uh, most of students go to uh, business administration, law, and others. Uh, total expenditure on R&D in Bahrain is growing. However, it's not as what we wish. So the funding is, is, is another challenge. So it was 5.7 million BD raised to 7.2. Number of collaborative research projects with the private sector, that's very important. Again, it's slow, and, the, and, and these might be very minor projects. Uh, number of research projects funded by regional uh, international um, resources growing, however, uh, still we're looking for, for, for better funding. Number of joint projects with regional international uh, institutions, again, uh, growing. So a Kingdom of Bahrain uh, effort uh, in terms of, of the pandemic, during the, the, the pandemic there, there were 138 publications, 39 only re COVID related uh, projects. We have uh, RCSI, when we talk about private uh, higher education institutions only, we had a meeting last week or, or a couple of weeks ago with all presidents of, of, of private sector higher education institutions, and uh, they mentioned uh, several research papers published, and uh, we have the Royal College for Surgery in Bahrain, they, they published several papers, uh, the, the, the banking sector, several universities, uh, there are four book chapters published, uh, we have several research projects, a clinical research center is to be established and several projects are going on and uh, in terms of, of COVID. So the, the, um, uh, what we talked about show, shows us a um, little bit about the, 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 the status of, of research in Bahrain. So in the Gulf region and Bahrain generally, so, so in, in Bahrain specifically, the expenditure of, on research in, in Bahrain uh, compared to the GDP is 0.04 unfortunately, compared to the uh, um, uh, other GCC countries, it's, it's lower. It's still, we're doing much lower than, the, than other parts of, of the world. Uh, here are some strengths and weaknesses when we started doing the research strategy for Bahrain. Uh, uh, we work with the Stanford Research Institute. We found that there are some weaknesses and, and some uh, strength in the research area in Bahrain. So uh, the culture needs to be improved. The funding needs to be improved. And I think we all share similar uh, uh, ideas. So uh, strategic direction and leadership is needed. Scientific infrastructure, laboratory equipments, test beds and so on, expanded societal understanding of the value of research. Most of the research happens in the Arab countries and, and, and Bahrain as well. Uh, it's only for a promotion and it's, and it's not connected to the, to the real priorities of the country or of the world or, or, or of, for the well-being or for the private sector as well. So a stronger linkage and collaboration needed with international parties, with, with the private sector, with the industry to solve real problems and to move to the knowledge-based economy that uh, my colleague from Kuwait, I'm sure, will, uh, 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 will um, uh, share his experience with us in this regard. So we ended up with a few uh, strategic objectives. We need to establish a national research governance infrastructure, strengthen the research capacity, strengthen the co collaboration with, with international entities, and improve the pu public awareness and address the national research priorities. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I didn't take so long, and I'm trying my best to be within uh, the, the, the uh, allowed time. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Farzana. That was very, very good, and a very good start as well. And uh, well precise, well documented. Now, Professor uh, Farzana, if you allow me, I will, uh, if I can put you on, uh, on if, you, if you can hold for your questions now, and let yeah. me perhaps introduce Professor uh, Moiz Bakhit. He's also with the Gulf University in, uh, in Bahrain. But uh, I think for Professor Moiz, uh, well it white, he's one of those scientists whether you call him Arabic or uh, Swedish or Sudanese, whatever it is, he's one of the worldwide scientists being highlighted in uh, worldwide in his scientific contribution in this area. And I think 
in all Arab channels, I have seen him. I don't think I have seen any other scientist worldwide from the Arab countries is being featured on the news all the time, like almost uh, on a daily basis, you will see him commenting on everything. He is a scientist. He is the head of molecular uh, medicine at the Gulf University. He has published a lot on also, I think he had made scientific contribution to understanding this virus. Uh, I think all of the, our speakers today, you will find their CV, but for, for Professor Muiz, uh, I think that is, you can uh, look at tremendous uh, or a large number of publications in cell biology, in molecular bi uh, medicine, in uh, lots of areas, not just on the COVID. But in the COVID, his remarks scientifically are there. So if I can maybe introduce you, Professor Mwais, to maybe continue on what Dr. Farzana has said, but also uh, you have contributed worldwide. Uh, do you see others? I'm not going to put you on the spotlight by saying, are there any others you can not name them, but are you uh, happy with the contribution? Arab scientists, not yourself in particular, have contributed to the massive or global collaboration to find a solution, not necessarily the vaccine. I know in the UK, we have lots of people, uh, Sudanese doctors and others, doing lots of work on public health and so on. So Professor, maybe you can highlight and tell us what contribution do you think the Arab scientists like yourself on the ground have made to the global uh, fight against this virus? Uh, thank you, Professor Alam, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Farzana. You said uh, almost everything I wanted to say. Uh, uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, Arabs who are uh, still contributing to the COVID and to the other research, but outside the Arab world. They are in the Western uh, countries, in the United States, in Europe, in the United Kingdom, and they have been participating even in these vaccines, like some Sudanese doctors on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. But I want to go to the root of the problem, why they are there contributing and not in their home countries. And I can just in, 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 in a few minutes tell you my experience. When I went from Sudan to Sweden more than 32, 33 years ago, I went as a doctor to be specialized as a clinical neurologist. I have no idea what is science, what is research. I never hold a pipette in my life. And then when I went there, I was doing my residency in clinical neurology. By accident, my professor discovered that I'm a poet. I'm writing poet, poem. And that was my main thing uh, in life, poem. And then he came to me, he said, oh, you are a poet. And then he, he was about to talk about patient something. And then he turns a conversation about imagination and those who are talented in writing or in poem or in drawing. And he said, we need such people in research. We want you to contribute to research. I said, I don't know what is even the word research. He said, no, we will teach you. We want to use your imagination in research. So, they started to teach me how to hold the pipette, I swear. They started to teach me how to work with the cell, how to, and then I, I became excited, interested. They put me with a technician. And just to cut it short, as a result of this, I published my first paper in cell. Can you believe? The highest paper. And then he told me, I told you, you are a poet, you have even imagination. And then that I made a big discovery by accident, Tawfiq Man Allah. Anyhow, then I became much, much interested in research, learning, publishing, excited. Uh, I had patents, uh, and then things became more into innovations. And I was not that time thinking about promotion but we were publishing, publishing, and then 
I could manage to get my residency and PhD and, and to get a lot of funds to support groups. And that was the Karolinska Institute, the house or the home of Nobel Prize in medicine. So from someone who is really naive, they picked him up and they made him a scientist. And then I won the award of the strategic researcher of Sweden. And then I got the Swedish nationality as just uh, as an honor, okay? And then I got a lot of funds, millions, and established my lab, my students, et cetera, et cetera. And I went both into clinic and into research. I tell you, I moved to Bahrain for some reason, there is as a sabbatical, but when I came, I wanted to practice also as a clinician and to establish the research in the Arabian Gulf University and the graduate programs, the PhD, which I did. But I remember when I went to the hospital the first time, when they uh, took my CV, my colleagues, the senior doctors, the consultants, they were, we were talking in the coffee room and then they said, oh, you are a researcher, you are a scientist, you are not a clinician. I said, no, I'm a clinician, I have the board, but you are a scientist. As if I am something very bad. That's, uh, and that's, I, I, I was so shocked because the lack of culture of science in the Arab world is a problem. Then I remembered in Sweden what happened to me. And then my kids, when they went to nursery and school, the first thing they got in grade one was science projects. They learned research methodology. They were knowing science better than me when I was started in grade one when they were six and five years old. So they started by projects. They were, they were teaching them science by projects, not in class. And they go to Cosmonova and see the world and the stars, and they go to the, the uh, forest and study plants and things and make projects while when they were six years old. Okay, things which I came when I was adult, I didn't know even what is research. So the lack of culture, the lack of educating and supporting and funds and uh, the, 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 the councils, the research councils to, to take all these and look at them up. Okay, then one step went that they wanted for promotion to have publications. So my colleagues started to come to me, can you help, can you help us with some, or put our names in some papers so we want to get promotion. Okay, but in Sweden, the idea was not just promotion because we were interested in innovation. And then the university started to have biomedical uh, research, uh, uh, like uh, institutes for incubation, uh, companies, startup companies, uh, help you with patents, registering. And then people were thinking about for research, looking into innovation and patience that research will pay back one day. We lack this patience. We want just to consume and get back results. So, there is no budget put for research because what will come out of research after 10 years, 30 years, uh, one innovation, for example, when I was in Sweden, the Astra company discovered the Lusek for, for uh, the uh, treatment of the gastric ulcer. And that discovery, Sweden had a little uh, economical crisis, that discovery changed whole Sweden, the whole budget. One discovery of one drug, one innovation by just a single scientist. And then other companies, of course, uh, did Scania, Volvo, IKEA, all, all were innovations, all were small innovations, small innovations, uh, startup companies, incubators, helping people, and then publications will come 
And that is what Dr. Prezana showed that companies are publishing and they are publishing because of these innovations. We lack all this. We lack the culture. We lack the, the basis for research uh, to, to, to teach our kids. And when, we, when I started the PhD program and the master programs, the students who come to us from, you know, the Arabian Gulf universities and the GCC universities. So they come from Kuwait, from Oman, from Qatar, from Saudi Arabia, from UAE, all of them, no exception. They don't know the research methodology and the basis of research. While kids in Sweden, when they are six years, they know research methodology because the lack of the proper strategy to grow with research since people are kids, because this is the real future and income and the budget and the economy based on these innovations and discoveries. And these discoveries will not come by promotion, will come by having startup companies, incubators and, uh, and innovations and having research councils, and not just having price to, to motivate, no must be a culture from the startup. So this is the, 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 the experience why those I mentioned in the beginning, they are very successful in the West because when they see that they are capable, they incubate them and they uh, take them up and they help them to grow as happened to me with professors. I don't know, just he discovered um, a poet and he thinks that is a good basis to be a good scientist. And uh, when I came here, I'm fighting, but we are making collaborations. I established the Center for Molecular Medicine and Genetics, a regenerative medicine programs, a personalized medicine program, the PhD in molecular medicines, cytogenetics, uh, biochemical genetics, molecular genetics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and now we have infrastructure to be shoulder by shoulder with the advanced world. But we need money, we need funds, we need research councils, we need infrastructure so that if I will be successful in the West, I can be very successful here and to make research culture. I think that's what I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Professor Mwais, and you are an excellent example of uh, Arabic science. I think uh, this is just very quickly on these two uh, contribution now before we go further. I think clearly they then an institution and, and government policy issues here. And also the societal issues, because like Professor Mwais said, it's culture. Uh, we don't treat science as this, but our scientists are proven their way all over the world because I think the environment in which they are operating it's enabling them to do the, to produce the best out of come of them. Now, uh, if I take India as an example, we visited India in 2001. I can't remember exact. Uh, I think it's 2001, and I remember in a place called Amity outside uh, New Delhi, like 50 minutes drive. <clears throat> they we visited uh, a biotechnology lab, not very big building, and they said to us at that time. I remember that was the first time I realized India is the way lit. Uh, largest producer of milk. I didn't know that fact before I went to India, but what they told us, they said, Alam, India will hold the key for the future of biotechnology research in the world. That was only exactly 20 years ago. And we can see now India is, is, is a leading country uh, because now uh, in Ox uh, Oxford, AstraZeneca vaccine, Indians are playing critical role in the manufacturing of this vaccine. Even the company, the only company in the United Kingdom produce this vaccine here in the UK. I was watching the CEO being interviewed. He said they are re relaying or relying on many of materials and so on and stuff to come from India. So India there, they're producing it worldwide. And here in the UK is an Indian related manufacturing. So that maybe lead me before I can go to our other guests, maybe to start with you, Dr. Farzana. Clearly, there is a governmental policy issues here. Governments, policy. Uh, if we know the importance of science, just take the example of India. They will be making, they have been, and they will be making lots of billions or, uh, or sorry, billions of pounds or dollars 
out of just manufacturing the vaccine. So just from that economic issue, you can see the government policy on investing or research is clearly here. Now, the, my question to you, Dr. Farzana, as someone in a leading government uh, front line on scientific research, the next, the boss COVID era is going to be more serious for government policy than the COVID itself. Because now hopefully we will get out of this crisis. Our prime minister said it will become something we will live with it like influenza, like anything else. So you will have it, you already been vaccinated and so on. The big task for the entire world now is economic recovery. Rebuilding the whole countries now is the issue. Even those with oil rich countries like Emirates, Saudi Arabia, they know it is not a time for oil. It is going to be how to rebuild the country. So there will be startups, innovation, digital economy, and so on, gig economy, like in the American, they call it. So where do you, are you comfortable? Are you feeling comfortable? Not just the Bahraini government, but in the Middle East, are we the, in, in research as a sci or scientists or the research uh, frontline, are we ready to rebuild our countries after this COVID-19? Are we really, or are we still fragile? The COVID-19 era exposed many scientific research uh, institutions in Africa. Most universities in the Middle East, they were unable even to operate online. Many of them in Libya, in Sudan, in many other countries. So apart from few in the GCCs like Bahrain, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and so on, Emirates, most of them are struggling even to operate online. So are you at all comfortable we will be able to rebuild our economy? Thank you, Professor, for your question. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to make to comment on on our universities that they couldn't to operate online. No, in 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 Bahrain, let, let's say we immediately shifted to online uh, virtual classes because the the ICT infrastructure in Bahrain is very strong. Bahrain ranks very highly uh, um, uh, globally in terms of, of of the network and ICT. So we immediately shifted to the to the virtual uh, the, uh, classes in almost all the universities and even the schools are doing uh, uh, their classes virtually. Uh, regarding your question, I think uh, the Arab countries and the GCC as well, um, for the short run now, uh, within the few coming years, I think they have other priorities than research. I don't know whether Dr. Mahiz will, will agree with me or, or, or not, because as you mentioned, the, the, uh, the, econ the, 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 the pandemic affected so much the economy. So I think there are other priorities than research for the time being, uh, for, uh, for the immediate uh, the response uh, to the pandemic. Uh, uh, to work on. Uh, and then um, uh, I think, yes, there will be a serious shift uh, uh, once things are settled and uh, uh, these kind of, of, of impact uh, managed, the economical uh, impact managed. I think we, are, we seriously need to move to the, to the um, knowledge economy. As you mentioned, the oil will disappear very soon, but uh, it won't exist uh, for long. The uh, Bahrain 2030 vision says that we need to move to, to knowledge-based economy. And without research, there is no knowledge-based economy. We need innovation. We need to, to convert uh, the research to products and uh, uh, to market that product to, to, to build our, our knowledge-based economy. So uh, without uh, research and, and, and STEM specifically, uh, and med medicine, of course, uh, we, we won't be able to convert to the uh, uh, knowledge-based economy. So, so I think, uh, uh, yes, we need, we need to move. Uh, uh, how, how much we are optimistic, uh, I can uh, ask Professor Maez to join in answering this regarding the priorities of, of the governments and countries for the time being, and how do you think of that? Okay, that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farzana. Maybe I can give the, the chance to Professor Mu'iz, but also Professor Mu'iz, if you can also comment on the following question, which is being raised. So from what you said, and Dr. Farzana, is it really those, uh, we don't have the culture of science and sci uh, science. Uh, I remember uh, Imperial College, uh, I can't remember, seven, eight years ago, they have two of their lecturers having some kind of uh, tour across the schools to try to encourage more young boys and girls, particularly women to join physics and chemistry, because we have seen it. I can tell you now, the leading school in all most British universities is business school. Not because I work in a business school, but that's how is it. We contribute more than any other school. I remember when I was at Sussex, 
we contribute more than any other school to the university. That's why there's not even at some point, Sussex University, which is uh, produced one of the Nobel Prize in chemistry was about to close because there's no many students studying science. So is that part of the culture in the Middle East or is it funding? Because we can see clearly the richest countries in the region like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, their universities rank is going very high. If you see that, people can say hypothetically, yes, there might be a relation between funding of scientific research and you go higher in the ranking, which is evident now, UAE and so other. So what is it? Is it our culture? We are not interested or we don't feel excited about science, scientists, like you have been excited, uh, you said in, in Sweden, or is it really the issue of money? Because most of the Arab countries are really poor countries. And they are not giving priority. They are giving maybe, or maybe the priority, there is money, but it's given to another priority. So what, what, what can you advise on public policy here? I think, I think the, the problem uh, is, is not only in the government uh, having just budgets. The culture is important. And I give you another example. Yesterday, I had three Bahraini ladies, young, very motivated, two of them educated in the United States and one educated in Oxford, in the United Kingdom. And then they joined my department a uh, uh, few months ago. And they came to me, they said, now three of us, one is in molecular genetics, one in artificial intelligence, and one in, uh, in biochemistry and cell biology. They said, we want to make a company. And then we need an incubator. We can make some, we can discover something. We can have innovation. We need just a little money. And then this company can, can invent something. And if it is in Bahrain here, yeah, we want to do it here, not in the United States. From what we learned there in the United States and in Oxford. If we make this company, we can get a lot of money, but not much the purpose, but even Bahrain can be very rich if we, if we come to innovation. And then I, I mentioned to them the innovations made by, uh, uh, in Sweden from my personal experience, what I saw, the discovery of a lot of things happened in Sweden while I was there in electronics, in Ericsson, the mobile phones, uh, and before the sewing machines and the submarines and this kind of Ikea and the Volvo and the belt, safety belts, small things, small things made Sweden one of the richest country in the world without any resource, without petrol, without agriculture, without food, animals, whatever, just small innovations. If we have this culture between our really clever and intelligent uh, people and scientists and researchers, and we can help them to, uh, by uh, supporting their projects, then they can grow. I know that the companies, the, the government is uh, thinking about other things regarding to properties, regarding to security issues, uh, the war in the regions to, to, to have the economy back after this crisis, etc. But still, they should not forget those young scientists. Uh, otherwise, they will go out of the country and they will be successful there. And they will get one of them, by the way, she got her green card and she will get the American passport very soon. So she will leave. She will not stay. If we don't be, yeah, I mean, uh, taking care of, of them in parallel together with the things. And we can look at Israel. Look at the research budget for Israel. It is 17 times more than the budget for research in all the Arab world, 17 times more. They discover the best drug for the treatment of multiple sclerosis in, in the 90s and still ongoing. And, and other companies like Merck in Germany and others, uh, Biogene, they are following. They are following them and making discoveries. Even Israel has big issues with military, with 
war, with security, but still they did not forget research, even with their very little resources. From where they have all these uh, big uh, budgets, because of they have innovations, they discovered a lot of things, a lot of small things made in Israel. You will see in all economy, in technology, in science, in research, even if we need order uh, to order some antibodies, some materials, they are much cheaper and quicker. Now we can get them from Israel. So if we order a, 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 a drug from or a material or antibody or a kit from Israel, it come next day and 10 times cheaper and better quality from when if we get it from others through other agents. Uh, uh, available in the, in the region. <coughs> so the idea is, is to, to, to encourage the private sector and to have some budgets as incubations for young scientists to make their innovations and to work when they work like those two, three young ladies uh, to, to have innovations and discoveries. And you see the two Turkish, the man and his wife, who discovered in BioNTech, the, the, they call it uh, Pfizer vaccine, but it is BioNTech. It's discovered by two, made a small company, working just in a small area of mRNA to make a vaccine since several years. And now they are multi-billionaires, not only for themselves also, but for Germany, even Germany all these innovations with their companies, and car, and electricity, electrical, uh, medical equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Why not we cannot be, if you go there, you will see our brands are there. Why not our brands here cannot make the same? Because we don't have infrastructure for them. I think things can go in parallel. We understand the government has big issues but small part can be done if we make this culture available. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Brian. There is lots of questions, Doctor. Uh, one thing I will mention it, and then maybe I will come back to you later, Doctor Farzana. You can also comment on that. Uh, not just being a woman, but I think you are a women leader. That's why I think we should listen to you. The UNESCO latest, latest report also mentioning something very interesting. They said uh, Arab women, particularly North African they are quite massively now into science. This is the latest report. So we have a new statistic saying that our women in Arabs, particularly in North Africa, are really, and I am waiting for Professor Abdel Ghadir, he can also comment on that. Let me take questions. If you would like to ask a question, please make it as short and simple, right to the point, so we can give much, much uh, opportunity to others. You can use that reaction uh, function on the Zoom at the bottom. It have one of the hand. I have a hand already raised and I'm glad it is, uh, we still having connectivity problem with Khalid al Hashash from Kuwait. We, I will, I will, we will let him in. But I will give the question now to Malaysia, Professor Sadiq Musa Ahmed from, uh, from the University uh, of Multimedia in, uh, can you introduce yourself, Professor Sadiq, and ask your question, please. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Rabbi Allah. And thank you very much, Prof. Uh, second speaker. I am Asik Mohammed from the Media University and Professor of Economics, and specifically in the knowledge and digital economy. Uh, regarding uh, recent development, actually, in, in our region, and especially in, we have to be that research and development is an art and mental satisfaction to contribute in terms of the researcher is lacking this because the environment is not conducive for research and development. Unfortunately, most of the Arab universities, especially the Gulf countries, they don't have postgraduate programs. As we know, research and development normally run by the postgraduate, uh, postgraduate student, PhD and master student, postdoctorate. And so the problem is a very fundamental problem. There is no culture, there is no environment, there, is, there are no incentives to contribute. This country has attracted many people, very talented people from worldwide. And unfortunately, they went there and only they count the money. They don't do any research. 
and even they, they lag behind. They lag behind. They can come to Malaysia, they cannot teach in Malaysia because they are 10, 10 years behind in terms of teaching and research and everything. To me, is the problem is the policies of the government, the culture of the people, the environment. All these, if not change fundamentally, the, our regions, our areas, they will never follow the uh, international research and development. All the contributions that are talking about uh, ranking of university and all these, this is only exaggeration. To me, is exaggeration. If you look back to the publication, all, all of them, they paid publication. There is no genuine contribution actually from the scholars. And there is no, there are no genuine contribution from the universities. So this is the problem that we are having now. Can you please give us your view about this? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Sadiq. Uh, who would like to tackle this, uh, Dr. Farzana or Professor Mwais? Uh, you got someone here, Amal Ali said, I agree with you, Professor Sadiq. So Professor uh, Mwais or Dr. Farzana, anyone would like to respond to this? Yeah, uh, I, I think what he said is correct. This is why when I came here as Arabian Gulf University, there was no graduate programs. I established the research uh, graduate programs when I came from Karolinska Institute because Karolinska Institute is a medical university of Stockholm. It gives a Nobel Prize in medicine so for those who doesn't know it. It has 150 medical students. It's only medicine but it has 5,000 PhD student, 5,000 PhD students because I'm postdoc maybe 10,000. And those who are really generating the real genuine research and, and finding uh, uh, new uh, innovations. And uh, I, I had my, my, my uh, patents while I was there, but when I came here, I, I said Arabian Gulf University must establish graduate students. So we started in the College of Medicine, the, the master program, first in laboratory medicine, then in molecular medicine, then the PhD in molecular medicine, then the master program in uh, regenerative medicine with stem cell science and uh, anti-aging medicine and then in genomic medicine, in personalized medicine, through good collaborations with big universities, with Harvard, with Cambridge, with University of Tokyo, with uh, Osaka universities. Uh, so we have this. And, and, the, and by having this graduate, and now we are fighting to have the postdoc system because the postdoctoral system is the, is the best system to grow the graduate program. I think by doing this, we will bypass making the papers. Uh, I, don't, I cannot say fake, but they, they are mainly made for promotion of the academics and of the staff and for, but not for really discovery and innovation, because even if you have an innovation, they don't know what to do with it, where to register, what is the process for a filing a new innovation and going further and these are very expensive processes etc but through collaboration uh, things can can, can improve and, can, and we can bypass the problems and luckily we have a lot of people who trained in the in the west in the culture of research if they get support and if we get the infrastructure if we get our strategy, which is very clearly written uh, uh, and get uh, funds for it, I think things will, will completely change and people will be attracted, not just to get money or to publish, but to innovate and progress and be leaders in their countries and in the world. Okay, now, uh, thank you very much, Professor Mwais. Uh, Dr. Farzana, if I can ask you this next question from the Facebook. Who are, it is in Arabic, but I think it's in English, it's very simple. Uh, this is how is it in English. Uh, we heard it many times, or not the excuse, it said, we Facebook. It's not a nice way to say, 
لكن وي ار نوت كونتريبيوتنج يعني بقول لك الكلام ده يا دكتوره مع كل الاحترام والود سمعناه كثير يعني بنسمع فيه من زمان الطلاب فانت يو ار ليدنج ساينتفيك ليدر ان ذا عرب وورلد وات كان يو سي؟ از ات ريالي سمعناه كثير ولا وات از نيو؟ اي مين فور مي your approach you, you the way you and others young generations are really now new having new perspective but سمعناه كثير قال لك يا دكتوره what what can this be we heard it many times uh, yes <laughs> yeah i agree uh, in every conference and every uh, gathering and every event we keep on saying our challenges here are our challenges we have to do this and this still um, not uh, really things are, are, are changing um, uh, but before that i'd like to comment on on, on the previous um, uh, uh, talk uh, regarding the, the postgraduate degrees yes i do agree uh, our universities and, and our countries do not really have that that much postgraduate degrees um, uh, however it's not about the quantity we do have several uh, postgraduate Uh, programs, PhD, masters, and so on. Uh, it's not about the quantity uh, uh, rather than the quality. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, in several countries, last year we visited UK, uh, 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 several UK universities, and they do have PhD laboratories and labs, and, and, and PhD students do attend in the companies for three years. They solve a real problem over there. The, uh, uh, it's not a, just a regular PhD program that's academic, 100% pure. They go to the university, come back and they do a piece of research. That, that piece of research is over the shelf. So we, we produce several, uh, uh, several researchers like that. Uh, uh, what, what we really need are the uh, uh, postgraduate programs that do serve exactly the, 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 the needs of the community, the needs of the industry, the needs of the different sectors in the country. Uh, this way, uh, the research will be really contributing to the, uh, the uh, priorities of the country. Thank you very much, bro, uh, uh, Dr. Farzan. Let me give an opportunity. Now, as I said to anyone who would like, please just uh, use the, 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 the hand. I can then see you easy. Now, Dr., uh, let me give this opportunity to Dr. Professor Alain Nadidi from uh, Cameroon. He's a well-known professor of entrepreneurship. He used to be a head of department. He's a senior consultant to World Bank. Yes, Professor, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Professor Alain. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Alam, and uh, thank everybody. I'm very pleased to be here with you in this platform. I uh, really appreciate the thought-provoking papers presented by both speakers, and really I've learned a lot. And uh, before I continue, I would like to have uh, the program that you use in order to assess all the, pro the, the, the papers published online by all these Arab countries. I would like maybe uh, to duplicate the same program here in Central Africa or in Francophone African countries. Okay, to come back to my organization is uh, Foundation Lands d'Afrique. Uh, we are a, um, an empowerment um, research organization based in Burundi, South Africa, and Cameroon. Uh, we are supporting uh, tertiary institutions in these countries and even Uh, neighboring countries. Uh, we have researchers across the world who are working with us directly. Last year, we published up to uh, February this year, we already published almost 20 papers on COVID. Um, but the most important one last year was the conference that was organized in Burundi. And the theme was uh, Burundi and the resilience to COVID-19. The conference was supported by the, the government of Burundi. We have uh, almost uh, 100 participants, uh, 22 papers presented in one day. It was very hectic. Um, the output of the conference is going to be released very soon uh, through a book in which we are going to have uh, more, uh, something like 19 papers because uh, at the end, some researchers did not give us their final papers. Uh, what we can say regarding COVID, I want to say in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in Francophone uh, African countries, even uh, some Anglophone countries, is that uh, we have three trends. 
The first one was between uh, January and uh, uh, May. People were very alert, were very concerned with the issue of COVID. They were take, taking a lot of precautions uh, in order to prevent that disease. But from July up to December, people are really, uh, they are useless. They don't want to take any measure in order to protect themselves without, against COVID. And this is very a big concern, especially since January with the second wave of uh, the pandemic. Uh, there are many dead, uh, people are dying regularly and the government in some of these countries, they are taking measures in order to encourage people to adopt the, the measure or to protect themselves against the pandemic. Um, if we go back to South Africa, I know that uh, they took uh, measures of uh, really uh, courageous measures in order to protect their population. Uh, but they have a very, it hit really the, 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 the population economically because people were not working, there was a lockdown. And uh, the government is trying now to take alternative measures in order to assist population, in order to deal with the pandemic. Um, yeah, this is what I can say. I'm very pleased to be here. I think that I will learn more from you guys. And if there's something that I can contribute, I will do so. And I also, there's a point that uh, was highlighted by one of your, one of one speaker there on uh, postgraduate program. Uh, we are having also the program here with postgraduate uh, graduate program, especially PhD. Uh, sometimes people are based in the continent, they, they have to go or they, now, uh, through online programs, you can have programs of PhD in US or in UK. The aim is to try to see how we can have the localization of some of these tertiary institutions in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, in order to ease the task of some of us uh, to conduct research with our with students for their PhD. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Alam. Thank you very much, Professor Allen. Thank you very much. Now, the, the question uh, quickly, because I know the time, both of you are very busy. Uh, I will translate in English. Why Arab countries, uh, maybe Dr. Farzana can better answer this, why Arab countries are not col collaborating and learning lessons from each other? Just take the example of Mu'iz, uh, Professor Mu'iz Bakhit Center in Bahrain, which is recognized internationally. Why other Arab countries are not learning from each other? Are you collaborating, Professor uh, Farzana, with others? Um, yes, there are collaborations. Uh, if you remember in, in, in my presentation, I presented the collaboration between Bahraini researchers and, and, and researchers from, from other, other countries. Uh, however, if you notice, Saudi Arabia was the first, for example, for Bahraini researchers. Saudi Arabia was the first. And then uh, all other countries were non-Arab. For example, US, I think it was, and then United Kingdom, India, and so on. And then Egypt comes back and, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, however, uh, what do we really uh, uh, what do we really need is to um, um, uh, collaborate in terms of several things for example infrastructure equipments uh, we might have an equipment here we bought it uh, very expensively but it is not really used uh, however there are some other researchers in, 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 in the region let's say who uh, do really need such equipment or, 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 or facility uh, and uh, it's not available over there so so I think we need we need to uh, enhance our collaboration in terms of the resources um, uh, as the funding is is one of the challenges, then I think we need to be smart to um, in, in dealing with our resources, uh, especially the the the, the uh, infrastructure, the laboratories, the equipments. Uh, I think we need to work better in that regard. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there's any other question, I'm really keen on the next few minutes because both of them they have other commitment. Uh, we're still having problem connectivity with uh, Kuwait and others. And also we have to weigh the timing. Really, it's not easy to get everyone at the same time. But I promise you, even this afternoon, we can come back and, and we will get them once they're back. Any question? Any question? خطوط عريضة لما بعد الكوفيد ما بعرف إيش المقصود بخطوط عريضة What is it? Uh, the question maybe uh, or maybe let us use it as a conclusion 
Can you both give us a roadmap for uh, how the scientific community in the Middle East, in the Arab countries, will help? What what what, what is the key priorities now after post COVID? Now the COVID, now people are in the vaccination. Every country is doing the same in Arab countries and other. I know, I remember Professor uh, Abdel Fattah, he might come now on board from uh, Morocco. He said, uh, Moroccans are really doing very well in vaccination. For example, Egypt, Sudan, many Arab countries now, I know UAE, Bahrain, Saudi vaccination is well ahead of the game. I think UAE is number two after Israel in the whole region. So now next, which we talked about earlier, uh, can you give a quick roadmap before you go, both Professor Moise and Farzana, a recommendation? What is your strategic priorities? One, two, three. I think uh, uh, first we have to learn from what happened in the, in the, in the COVID-19 uh, era. And uh, to make that uh, as a basis for recommendations. Um, first, without this extensive collaboration that happened between scientists all over the world and also the input of the government and the companies financially and the support. And we wouldn't have come to these discoveries which helped in to, to reach the vaccines development, including the uh, next generation vaccines, RNAs, DNA, the subunits, the other types of vaccines. <coughs> so this first recommendation is to strengthen the collaboration between the uh, uh, scientific and research centers within the Arab and the world. And the second is the budget. We have to allocate budget for research and development for our research institutes and scientists and uh, motivate and help them. And and, 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 and the third thing is to build the culture for research, starting from early lifetime, even from nurseries. So, because if you look into the old histories, hundreds of years ago, if you look into different science, you will see Arabs or Muslims, they have discovered a lot of things in aviation, in mathematics, in uh, irrigation, in agriculture, in things. It, it, it was a culture that time. So we have to make this culture available, the three things, making the culture, the collaboration, and allocation of, uh, of budgets. This is the only way to, to help the post COVID-19 era. And especially there are a lot of things to do. We have the post COVID-19 syndrome, no one knows about it. And there are some differences still in the response to the viral infection and in the immunopathogenesis and the pathophysiology and a lot of to be studied on the immune response and, and also uh, including treatment, still we don't have treatment. So there's a lot of things to be discovered, even the vaccines, not to just get vaccines from China, make. Uh, factory. No, we can make our own vaccines and develop them, even smarter vaccines. We have smart people here, but they need the scientific collaborations, they need the budgeting, they need the culture, not only to our kids, but also to our uh, decision makers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Moise. And I think these three key points will take them forward. Very good three key points. Before I go to Dr. Farzana, culture, collaboration, and budget, and they will be key into our major conference. But before you go, Professor Mais, I, I, I know everyone will want to ask you this, but there is a question, and I can see Dr. Farzana answer it, would complete uh, coverage of vaccination, which means if complete vaccination is happening in a country, would that uh, stop the COVID. I think Dr. Verdana said no, but you can answer it. But more importantly, before you go in the, in the other side of you, which you, you are a leading scientist, are you happy with the situation of vaccination in the Arab countries? This is a side question. 
because this is the issue. We are still locked. Are you generally from your follow up, not just in the GCCs? Do you feel co have, co happy with the way vaccination is taking place in the Arab countries? I'm happy with the government approach to 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 make the vaccine available and put all efforts to organize that. But I'm not happy about the people behavior because first they are listening a lot to the uh, anti-vaccine uh, activist uh, uh, campaigns and they were scared and they are not listening to real scientists. They are listening to terrible scientists putting the, as we say in Arabic, putting a uh, sum fidesam. They are saying a lot of things, making them scaring of, of getting the vaccines. And every time they, they recall old videos and edit them in a wrong way and put them and make them more uh, uh, problematic. So if it is, if, if, uh, if, if even good educated uh, countries have 100% uh, vaccine success, still, if the world is not covered, equity is not achieved, then still we cannot get rid of the, the pandemic uh, because now the world is very well connected. Uh, we need to reach at least 75% of the world, get vaccinated and people follow all the protection uh, measurements, uh, washing hands, having the mask and uh, having the social distances follow this together with the vaccines. Otherwise, we will just go around a vicious circle, listening to terrible, terrible people uh, want uh, us not to get vaccinated. They want the kids not to get vaccinated because the vaccines will do this, will do that. And uh, the last thing I heard that this is a big gene therapy trial, the vaccine. Uh, it's, it's a lot of terrible things which is not making sense to a scientist or to someone who is not uh, scared to logical people. Get the vaccine better than getting the virus. Thank you very much, Professor Guys. Uh, I think this is a very strong message from uh, a leading scientist in the region. And I think also it's, it's, if the professor is going the same line with what our government is saying, our government is saying we owe the success in turning uh, the number of deaths into uh, this low number. Now we're talking about tens. We're not talking about southern in the UK. We are doing very well. He said, I owe all this. This is all you. We're referring to other citizens, not the scientists. So I think what Professor Brian is saying is a very strong message. Government, he said, they are doing well, in, good enough, what, what all that means. But people, people are not doing enough. And I think we have seen lots of terrible stories in Arab countries. Now, Dr. Farzana, final words. In addition to changing the culture, collaboration, and making the budget available, not just from government, but from agencies like Islamic Development Bank, Arab whatever foundation, what else can you add in the complete, to complete the roadmap, which we will take it further? Yes, what, what more than culture, collaboration, and budget? I think uh, Professor Maiz, because I said uh, everything he wanted to say in the beginning, he said now everything I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because I really do agree. I have the same points, by the way. Um, uh, what happened with the pandemic is that for the people in the Arab countries who do not really believe in the in the research and the importance of the research, what happened with the pandemic once the pandemic ca came. All the eyes are towards the research centers. Please solve our problem, isn't it? So now the culture should should move a, a bit. Should uh, should should really um, uh, believe in the importance of the research for the well-being of the humanity, for human being, and uh, for everything else, for the economy and, and so on. So the culture, culture, culture of research need uh, to be uh, enhanced. I remember one day we worked with, with, with people from the business, uh, it was Aramco. They said, you academicians, you take long time to solve a problem. We don't have time. We need uh, some uh, time as money for us. We need a solution tomorrow. So uh, companies and businesses do not really believe in, in the academic research, uh, but I think uh, the, the culture is changing and should change now, especially after the pandemic, uh, everyone was looking into the research centers, 
please uh, uh, bring up a, a vaccine or, or any solution for, for this pandemic. Uh, uh, collaboration, again, we cannot work uh, uh, separately. So, so uh, uh, all the vaccines that you can see uh, uh, almost happened uh, th through uh, collaboration projects. And the funding, sometimes the funding sometimes is there and there is not a real smart way to, to manage it. Uh, a couple of weeks we were we were in a meeting with, with presidents of private higher education uh, institutions. Can you imagine that, that some of them, uh, one of them actually said that because by law we, we mandate that they should allocate 3% of their total income for research. Imagine that one of the presidents said, I cannot spend that 3% because we have only uh, business administration programs and law, and these uh, do not really need so much money for research. Can you imagine that they have the 3%, they have to use it, they said, uh, we cannot use it, imagine. So sometimes uh, uh, funding, yes, it's a problem, and managing the funding is another problem, and uh, uh, collaboration in terms of, of utilizing a, a maximum efficient utilization of the infrastructure and, and, and facilities and equipments, I think, is needed. Thank you very much, Dr. Farzana. And uh, I, um, I have two minutes. If there is any final comments, I think there is lots of people I can see head of school deans, particularly from Arab countries. If anyone would like to take the last two minutes before I close, because I promised those people not to take more than their uh, time. I really want to close it. But if there is any comments, anyone can raise hand uh, from any country, maybe countries where we didn't hear, for example, like Kuwait, uh, because Khalid couldn't connect easily. Egypt, I can see. Anyone would like to make a final comments? Uh, let me see. Uh, I think we need to build a strategy for the impact of the pandemic, such as the mental issues. Yes. We have done lots of webinar on this, Amir's. Uh, he said mental health. I think the good thing we got lots of, I remember we have done lots of this. Anyone, any question? I'm really, please accept my apology if I haven't seen you. Anyone would like to make a comment before we close? Okay, I would like you all to join me uh, from wherever you are, homes, offices, to just to say thank you to those most distinguished contribution we receive from both Dr. Farzana and Baragi, the senior, uh, the sorry, the leader or the director of scientific research at the government of Bahrain in the higher education, and Professor Mohiz Bokhid, a well-known scientist, academic head of the Department of Molecular Medicine. He is someone also scientifically contributed to the global combat of this uh, pandemic. I would like to thank you all for attending. I know uh, Farah Abu Sheikh, unfortunately, it's meant to be a very short, precise workshop because you have to appreciate these people are giving it their time and it's very uh, challenging. Thank you very much for everyone. I'm glad we telling you Mervin today. We are within the, within the two hours time. Hopefully we are hoping, according to our prime minister, uh, I think this is a good comment. Let me just read it. Uh, at Abdul Hamid, Shoman Foundation in Jordan, we have launched a scientific research support fund dedicated to COVID-19 during the pandemic. Excellent. So if you if you contact me, Farah Abu Abu Shiha, I think Farah, if you contact me, we can spread this. Very good, Abdul Hamid Shom Shoman. Sorry if I Shoman Shoman if I pronounce it wrong. Please accept my apology. Uh, they have they have launched. Uh, Arab Research yes, Award, the fairest award of this kind among Middle East dedicated for scientific excellence. So let's contact offline and then we will, because this is what we do in the Middle East. Just to, to end up with very positive, uh, some statistic. Number one, in the Arab countries, until recently, maybe change, I'm not sure, but until recently, the leader in desalination, uh, water desalination, if you like know-how and research, is Saudi Arabia. They are leader in desalination technologies. Many people, even in Saudi Arabia, when I mentioned that, they didn't know that. In terms of GIS, one of the leader in the Arab countries is uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, particularly Al Ain, you know, Al Ain uh, municipality. In agricultural research, until recently, Sudan is one of the leader in agricultural research. So we do have very positive uh, things to celebrate as well. So imagine I said in the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi in 2011 major conference, I said to Arabs 
why not you learn? So in Kuwait, in any other country, they can learn uh, water desalination technology from Saudi Arabia. Others can learn agricultural research from Sudan. We learn GIS from al Ain municipality and so on. This is what is happening in Europe. Anyway, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of today. It's still holiday in the UK, but we are still working, which is usual. We work Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, I hope it will it benefit people. We, the recording will go live once we have it done from Mervin. Thank you very much, all of you. And have a, uh, enjoy the rest of today. If you are going to bed now shortly, like people in Malaysia, have a good night. Assalamu alaikum fi amanillah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much. We're really grateful. Thank you very much. Salaam alaikum. Thank you very much. So please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.